I once again want to state that I appreciate uh, any individual's devotion to the Word of God, and we do not want to detract from that for one moment. I mean that, our brother Woods. Since there has uh, been a quota some quotations taken from uh, our literature, I felt constrained to share with you a quotation that I just received here, sent by uh, a brother in the Lord, that gives a quotation from the uh, Teacher's Gospel Quarterly from the Gospel Advocate Company in October and November, December of 1930. Since there was reference made to the historical position on the Holy Spirit taken by the Church of Christ, I thought it might be of interest to hear one of the historical positions. These terms of admission are first a wholehearted faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of men, a genuine and thorough repentance from all known sin, a public and unequivocal confession of Jesus Christ in the presence of men as the Son of the living God, and baptism by the authority of Jesus Christ into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Compliance with these conditions brings to each one who complies with them the promise by the authority of Christ of the remission of all past sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit as an abiding and indwelling guest and comforter. Uh, at any rate, I thought that was of interest that perhaps the position has not been as consistent as has been represented. The charge that I am confused and bewildered, of course, does not hold because it has been asserted by my opponent. He confirms that the Holy Spirit inaugurates and carries through the entire work of conversion and sanctification, every aspect of it, and states that it's not a question of how the Spirit dwells in us, of if the Spirit dwells in us, but how the Spirit dwells in us. <clears throat> now, I have not been a student of the Word as long as my astute opponent, but I have for some 35 years, and I am at a loss to recall where God made that distinction, where God said, that the issue is not if he dwells, but how he dwells, I confirm to you that that distinction has been made by my opponent and his predecessors, not by God. That I could read the scripture from now till the heavens pass away with a great noise, and the earth and all the works that are in are burned up, and I should never receive that from the revelation of the Holy Spirit. The issue is whether he dwells in us or not. That is the issue at stake here. Either that or words mean nothing. Does God really dwell in us, he says? Yes, God does dwell in us. We have it in Ephesians 2.22. Why I say that God dwells in us representatively? It says, In whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now all we have to have is a text of scripture that tells us that the Holy Spirit dwells in us and is a habitation, we are a habitation of the Spirit through the Word. We need some sort of a reference like that. The Word of God has asserted this. It has asserted categorically that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. If so be that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The assertion of Scripture is, ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit dwell in you. I trust that we're not going to be faulted for believing that as it stands. He does dwell in us. He does. As to the assertion that the Holy Spirit dwells in us in the same sense as the Father and the Son, that is in direct contradiction of Ephesians 2.22 that says the Father, God dwells in us through the Spirit, 
It does not say the Spirit dwells in us through the Word. He also asserts that the only information we have on how to live is the Bible, the bald text of the Scripture. Now we have in Scripture this word from the Apostle concerning the New Testament, which my opponent has mentioned quite frequently and which it appears he does not understand. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God, to God word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, for our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us an able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now I ask Brother Woods to define for us what the letter is. He has made reference to, quote, the book. I suggest that this is the apostolic term for the book. And that the allegation that the power was transferred from personalities to the book is not declared in Scripture. It is not asserted there. If it is, let's have it. Let's have what the Word of God says that the power was transferred from the persons of the apostles to the book. Where does it say that? As to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, uh, not being pertinent to the discussion, I did not say that. I said that that text, strictly speaking, was referring to the old writings of Moses and the prophets. Timothy was raised up in the scriptures which are able to make thee wise into salvation. The canon of scriptures was not complete there. And that what they had was able to make them wise unto salvation is evidenced by such saints as Simeon and Anna. I want Brother Woods to at some point deal with this question of whether or not the intercession of Christ is required for salvation. He has not dealt with that. If that is true, his concept of the efficiency of the scriptures falls to the ground. They are not thoroughly sufficient, not if it requires an intercessor sitting at the right hand of the living God. There is something missing here. And that's an understanding that redemption is larger in scope than just passing on some information. There is a welding together of the spirit of God and the spirit of man. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. My question, is he one spirit or not? Or has there ceased to be a joining to the Lord? Is there no more a one spirit between those that are joined to the Lord? What became of the Holy Spirit after the apostolic age? He is where he's always been. Where is that? Is he in the book? Do we have a magic potion of some sort here that we lay upon our breast at night for magical power? Is he in the book? I recall the words of our Lord that said, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come unto me that ye may have life and have it more abundantly. That simply indicates to us that there is something beyond the letter. It is in perfect conformity with the letter. It does not violate the letter, but the letter... The letter is impregnated, if you please, with life and power by the Spirit of God. The sufficiency of the word is pictured as being enlivened by the Spirit of God. Are the bodies of baptized believers the temple of the Holy Spirit? 
Uh, yes, and why does not God uh, dwell in us also? As I mentioned, because he dwells in us by the Spirit. <clears throat> Dealing with this text in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 6. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. In harmony with Ephesians 6, 17, which states that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. <clears throat> I want to know what rule of interpretation permits us to give the Word supremacy over the Spirit. That when we read in Colossians 3, 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and that when we read in Ephesians 5 and 18, be filled with the Spirit, what rule of interpretation, what strange insight has been granted to our teacher that tells him that the word there take supremacy over the Spirit. That somehow we are not really filled with the Spirit, but we are really filled with the Word. Are we faulted for saying that both of these are true? That the Word of Christ does dwell in us richly? That is, that we comprehend somewhat of its sensibility? And that we are filled with the Spirit that is enabled to implement the will of God, it is one thing, beloved saints, to know the will of God. It's another thing to do the will of God. And the indwelling is what makes the difference. That's what the church has that Israel didn't have. That's what the church has that people before the exaltation and enthronement of Christ didn't have. It's not information we need. We know what to do. It's the getting of it done. This incessant battle with the law of sin and death that's in my members. I maintain that has to be countermanded by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And I call upon you to be honest and filled with integrity. Can you do the things that God says to do with just your analysis of the Word of God. I pray the Spirit of Truth may dwell in you. The fact that the Word and the Spirit are used interchangeably does not by any means mean that they're synonymous. Take, for instance, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all associated with comfort. The God of comfort, Christ said he'd send the Comforter, and men were comforted in the Holy Ghost, Acts 9, 31. Justification is associated with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Sanctification is associated with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the Word is associated with God, the Word of God, Christ, the Word of Christ, and the Holy Spirit quickening the Word to us. Yet this in no way indicates that they are the same or that their ministries are exclusive of one another. The Spirit works through the Word, but not without a kindred work in the believer. 1 Peter, the first chapter and verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another out of a pure heart fervently. <clears throat> that the Holy Spirit could do this external to your persons, I deny. Emphatically deny. That I could obey the truth without being joined into one spirit with the Lord, I deny. And there are saints without number that can arise from ages past and testify that they were not made perfect without us. God having reserved some better thing for us. That better thing consisted of a union with the living God and with Christ and with the Holy Spirit. It is constituted a union through the Spirit now because it's by faith but it shall be consummated in a very real union of the person of God and the person of Christ and the person of the Spirit in the world to come, here by faith, through the Spirit. Is 
is the infilling of the Holy Spirit associated exclusively with miracles? <clears throat> I see that Brother Woods brought that matter up, and I want to deal briefly here with it. Firstly, miracles and the Holy Spirit are not necessarily joined together. We can have miracles without the Holy Spirit. They are called in 2 Thessalonians 2.9, lying wonders. And we can have the Spirit without miracles, as is evidenced by John the Baptist, who was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. I solicit both of those cases because they are spoken in distinction from the Word of God itself as a book, which word has been repeatedly used here. Men often were filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke forth the word of God. This includes Elizabeth, Zacharias, and the disciples of old. Yet in these instances there were no miracles, no speaking in tongues, no signs and wonders as they spoke. Further, the selection of the first servants of the church consisted of men full of the Holy Ghost of record, only two of them wrought miracles, Stephen and Philip. And Barnabas, who was full of the Holy Ghost, was associated with exhortation and comfort. I'm pointing out here that the indwelling of the Spirit is not tied necessarily to the miraculous order, but it is tied to the work of the kingdom. Are we to suppose that these men were filled with the Spirit without possessing the Spirit? that they were filled representatively, that he really was not operative from within them, but that he only ministered to them in an external or influential manner? Or are we to suppose that it was only for the first century? My opponent states that the scriptures teach that the Holy Spirit does not actually, bodily, literally, or in his own person, dwell in the individual Christian. Now, whatever may or may not be said about this debate, I am calling upon you to believe a categorical assertion by God. Brother Woods is calling upon you to believe an interpretation of an assertion of God. God said, I will dwell in them. He said, ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit dwell in you. I am affirming that's the truth. Where is the text that teaches that the Holy Spirit does not dwell in his own person, literally or bodily, in the individual Christian? Or, does the scriptures teach something they don't say? Or do we have dogma without assertion? Is it true that interpretation is equal to revelation? We demand a text that states this, that the Holy Spirit does not bodily, literally, or in his own person dwell in the individual Christian. We need a statement on that if the scriptures teach it. We are told by the word, which my opponent professes to accept as absolute authority, and whose integrity I do not question, that the Holy Spirit was a gift that was promised. We are told that in at least three places, Acts 2.39, unto you is the promise, and to your children, to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. We are told that in Galatians 3.14 that we receive the Holy Spirit of promise in accordance with the Abrahamic covenant and in Ephesians the first chapter and verse 13. Where is the promise of him dwelling with us representatively? And if that has not been promised, let me go on record if my opponent will not go on record that I want no part of a covenantal benefit that has not been promised, and I want the profit of a covenantal benefit that has been promised. 